I'm Adam Goss um, from Spirit of Space, and um, I co-founded it with uh, Red Mike, and we make films about architecture. We reveal why design matters. Yeah, this is Red Mike from Spirit of Space, and with Adam, I founded this company back in 2005, and we call ourselves the Architecture Paparazzi, and um, we just, we can't stop, you know, working with architects and artists to make films and tell their story. Both Adam and I are students of architecture. And in 2004, we took a study abroad program to Milan, Italy. And that's where we first met each other. We became friends throughout the semester. And you know, I bought my first digital camera. We were both filming stuff to share with our friends and family back home. And when we came back to school that following year, you know, we couldn't stop working on each other's projects, whether Adam was documenting my Temple of All Faiths and we made a film for the Midcrit or um, teachers were having, you know, student lec uh, lecturers from professionals come in, we were making films. And I think when it all changed that we said, hey, this is like, not only are we like staying up all night making these films and can't stop, but it could be a business and, and it's just so much fun is while we were students, the Marcus Prize, which is an international competition, chose MVRDV to be the first recipient. And they, the school hired us to make a film showing the design uh, deliberations so we could share with faculty why MVRDV won. And then Jeannie Gang, along with Robert Ivey and um, Aaron Betsky were in the, the jury. And she had a building that was the Starlight Theater in Rockford, Illinois. And it actually has this dynamic element kinesthetic where it opens up like a lotus flower. And while we were she just said, hey, would you guys want to film it? I, can't, I need, we can't show them pictures. And it just kept going on from there until we said, we don't need to work in an architecture office. Let's form a company. And when we, you know, Adam graduated and yeah, we started from there and I graduated a couple of years after, but we just kept going with it. Yeah, we are looking to find the stories in architecture that are changing the world. I mean, we when we started this in 2004, this is when all the photography and architecture had zero people in it. There's a thing to show architecture in its pure aesthetic form. And Mike and I just realized this is not how we actually experience architecture. And so we um, got heavily influenced by the Eames, Charles and Ray Eames, and they had this amazing diagram where it showed that they needed to connect with their client, with their passion, and with the rest of the world. And it was the first time we saw an architect actually communicating not just to themselves or the profession of architecture, but actually thinking, how do we make sure that, you know, everything we do, a little kid is going to understand it as much as like a master scientist, you know? And so just like them, we don't discriminate, you know, if the... You know, they work for corporations and institutions and governments and architects and universities and, and it all doesn't matter. I mean, if someone wants us to document an object that they made to an exhibition, to a building, to a city plan, you know, it's all whatever the right story is that we can get people outside of architecture to understand architecture. We want people to watch our films and learn and change their behaviors to see how to look at architecture, to understand why it's valuable, and why it is, um, why it changes the world, you know, for, for the better. Yeah, I mean, if we, if we can somewhat both answer, I, I can at least kind of set up the shot that I think success, you know, we have to define success, you know, and for us, it's not, I think, um, you know, success for us is when our clients trust us. You know, and it's about going out and making films that connect with people. And it can be very different. We, um, it's not about qualitative for us. It's not about clicks. It's not about likes, you know, or the hearts, you know, it's about the quantitative of what a film can do for somebody. Actually, just on our, recently on our Instagram feed, I was scrolling through it and there's, you know, a couple that have over a thousand views and then like one that has a hundred, but the one that has a hundred has way more shares than the other ones because that resonated for people in a different way. 
you know? And so whether we're making it, like we did this film, um, Mike can maybe speak to it too, um, just about the Chicago River for um, a Harvard studio. And just, you know, it was just to get good students to join the class. You know, the professor just wanted good students, but like the mayor saw the film and, you know, it impacted by putting money into the river and things. And so, you know, for us, all it takes is one person you know, for the film to be successful. We just did a film in La Tourette. And if people can watch that film and look at brutalist architecture differently, you know, for, you know, wherever they're at, you know, it's a success, you know? And so that's, um, maybe Mike, you can talk about some examples. Yeah, no, no, I agree. I think that for us, the success is that when we build a relationship with the client and they want a second film because they see the power, they see the feedback they got from the client or a publication or they, they, they fall in love like how we fell in love with making films and just talking about architecture. That's, that's ultimately the goal. And I think um, back to the Mies van der Rohe Award in 2019 when Lufer, the artist collective from Chicago did this amazing installation, sh you know, showing the grid with these lasers. Um, I reached out to friends who, who've moved to Barcelona and I said, you know, like, hey, there's this exhibition tonight, can you come? Like, and they're like, yeah, yeah. And I'm just like, you know, it's free. What, what, it's free? And like, they live there for years. And I think that's the whole point about films. And even in the situation today where people need to stay shelter in place, for when you can go out there and share that with someone, it's very, very small percentage of people that can actually go there to the building under the, the the brilliant lightning conditions or when a when a pavilion is up for such a temporary short period of time and these people can experience that of course you want to open that up and it's about the phenomenological experience but you could never have that experience if you're never able to go there and that's where the film bridges that gap and we know that as soon as we get to a space we're corrupting it we're putting it in a 2d medium you know we're rearranging the the procession but that we we accept that, and it's and it also offers a huge opportunity to to let people let their minds kind of rewind and unravel how the sequences come together, so that they can actually experience architecture. And I think we, that's what we are. We accept that this is a construct of what the architectural experience is, but we know it can reach everyone and anyone. Yeah, um, well, that was like a recent, yeah, a recent film that we just put up. And I mean, just like everyone, you you look at the social media, you look at, oh, you have new subscribers and you get excited. It's like, it's hard not to be human and do that, but and to fall for that kind of immediate gratification. But we need to have to be time and remember that everyone's willing to wait for a good story and no one's going to be upset they would be more disappointed to just rush something and get it out there. And one of our latest films that we released, I think amidst all this, the Corona times of people being at home and having just, you know, an overwhelming time to, to organize it, it didn't have the outreach that we expected for this building, which was the, um, by Stephen Hall Architects, the REACH, the Kennedy Performing Arts Center. And I, I think that, yeah, sometimes it's like, oh, you put this out there and it's also up to timing and to fate and what people wrote about, or can they find their own story? Would, you know, would a specific writer for a, a, a specific, you know, very um, prestigious publication, you know, will they pick that up? You know, and you have to just say, well, we put that film out there, but yeah, that, that didn't get the outreach that we expected yet. So we have to wait and see. <laughs> Yeah, this 100%, we need to get architecture into every other part of the newspaper, not just, you know, the architecture section. We need more people to care about their environment if things are going to change. And I think the problem is, is architects, they continue to, to communicate for themselves and for the profession, you know, and I think that's why it's not bridging over. And I think a great example is we met Eric Bricker, who did the visual acoustics film, is on Julia Shulman. 
And Julie Shulman, his very famous case study house film where the two girls, um, he, you know, the, his, that was one of his very original photos, but when it actually got published, it was all of the pictures where you didn't see any people at all. It was just like the pure structure. And it really, I mean, I don't want to speak for him. I don't know if it bugged him, but he decided to let's put that um, photograph out into the culture section. And all of a sudden that film or that photograph gets super widespread. It got on the cover of Time Magazine and all kinds of things like it this lit like wildfire. And nobody in the architecture profession even knew that because they weren't even reading those sections or understanding those sections. Like, you know what I mean? Like there was no connection. It wasn't until 25 years later that that photo finally made it into architecture magazines. And I think architects need to step up and try to think about communicating um, not just to themselves and to each other, but to the wider audience. I think it's absolutely, we need to be bridging into those other magazines. And I think Julie Shulman did it and he did it under the radar and it was super successful, but we don't need to do it under the radar anymore. Um, yeah, uh, yeah. In addition to what Adam said, you know, the old days of, of Frank Lloyd Wright being on Time Magazine, you know, one in a million architects, you know, that is just, that's not the times we live anymore. You can't wait till you can build a body of work that someone wants to make a, a sketches of Frank Gehry about you, you know, like, or show up on The Simpsons for five minutes of the entire 15 years of Simpsons. We need to, you know, we see architects joining TikTok and having Instagram accounts and we see proposals from architects stating that they have to make videos to show the committee. And we see, we see the, the mayors of, of towns when a, bill, when a competition wins, they need to disseminate information and say why this is the winning um, competition entry. And it just seems like that the most valuable thing that any architect or designer has, or an artist for that matter, is their time. And it would be almost negligent to not allocate a small portion of your design process to think about how am I communing myself? How am I communicating my work to the rest of the world? And whatever medium you use, whoever makes it for you, whether it's somebody on your staff, whether it's a new student intern that you guys got on the team that you want to send out to these projects, whether it's just yourself with a cell phone, like you just need to be doing it today. And we need on every level, we, we don't have to go there to be a, a social tastemaker, you know, the architects are not competing with celebrities, but, but people are out there and using these platforms and you just need to engage with that because that's how we're communicating with each other.